Hey, welcome back, everyone. Yay. Oh, there we are. We're back. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Beth over there on the left, Kathy on the right. We're going to talk about some threads. Hey. Yay. What's Marga saying? We're never moving again. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> we were a lot younger 30 years ago than when we last moved. Yes. All of those things. We're exhausted. Yes. But uh, finding things finding things has kind of been fun because it's like Christmas. Every box you open is something. Oh, that's where that went. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, I, I still find I still find boxes for stuff when when we moved the shop last time six years ago. Oh, uh huh. Oh, that's where that went. Yeah, I'll bet that was a treat. Jeez. Uh yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so it, behind me, all you're seeing is the uh, light blocking curtains on the windows, and that's purposeful because the rest of the room, it ain't pretty. <laughs> There's stuff all over. Yep. One day. But I put up pictures today with the podcast um, so you can see what the room looks like and all the stuff strewn all over. So um, <laughs> we'll keep everybody up to date. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Really glad to be back. Missed this doing this thing. Um, uh -huh. Fantastic. Oh, and we have our first thumbs down. Thanks to whoever that is. Yay. All right. <laughs> that, that might be the thumbs down to moving. <laughs> oh, that could be. Yeah. All right. We'll, get, we'll yeah. give the benefit of the doubt there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we're going to do some thread talk. And Kathy tonight is going to do... Oh, let me turn off. Kathy's going to um, talk about threads and texture, which is something when we yep. had Margaret Lee on here a couple weeks ago, we got to see a lot of what you can do with threads and texture and light. So Kathy's going to do that for us tonight. That was not planned. It was okay. just, just brilliant minds coming together without realizing it. <laughs> um, so with that, Kathy, I'm, I'm going to flip it right over to um, to your table there and let you have at it. Okay. Okay. There we go. Go. So um, I thought Gary had asked me a while ago about a whole bunch of different questions he had, you know, kind of put together over the years about things. And one of them involved, well, a whole set of them involved um, stuff about texture. It's like, how do you get texture? And this came up recently in a conversation with a customer who is a needle pointer, only knows how to do basket weaver tent stitch, and was really kind of um, uh, disappointed that she didn't know how to do all these super fancy stitches that she was seeing everybody else do. And my response was, you don't actually have to know anything other than one basic stitch, and you can adjust your texture with the thread. And the same is true for cross stitch. Um, and embroidery, although you get a lot less options because most of the threads that have a lot of texture to them are really thicker and made for needlepoint. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about tonight. And uh, in that texture range, probably about 90% what's on the market for texture actually comes out of one company, it's Rainbow Gallery. So Rainbow Gallery um, either manufactures um, or imports a variety of threads. Um, and so they range from stuff like Splendor, which is regular stranded silk, to something like the eyelash, which is what this is. This is one of those um, fuzzy, um, almost, in, my guess is, is that I think this is probably a knitting yarn because that's where a lot of the stuff comes from. And you can see it's just like super, super fluffy. So what i do is i just look at the threads and kind of go okay is do i actually have a use for this okay i do for this for this i would do it for like a bunny because if you wanted a really super fluffy bunny this would be great and if you wanted to do it as really fly away hair it would be great for that too so you know think about when you're doing particularly needlepoint or you're doing something on 18 count um cross stitch fabric which is the same count as most of the needlepoint canvases, then you know, you've got a bunch of options. So what I do is I make a little um, test thing. So this is, I'm usually way more organized and then I usually have a sheet to match it that tells me what went where. I did this while watching television last night and went, oh, you know what, I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, because I can kind of, you know, I've got the pile I started from. I can tell from from usually touching them which thread it is because I work with them so much. Um, 
And I will tell you a couple of tools that are handy to have. Well, three. The first is sometimes a bigger needle than what you normally use. So I use a 22 tapestry needle on 18 mesh. But for some of these threads, I use a 20 because I need the hole to open just a little bit more so it doesn't shred the thread, particularly something like the eyelash where it's got all these wispy bits and sometimes it wants to pull them off. That, but that, um, uh, that thread, that eyelash holds up surprisingly well. I did some tests with that. It does. And I expected it to come all apart and it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's kind of no, impressive. No, it's surprisingly, yeah. I, mean, I think it's because if you look at the core, which I will find here, um it's actually got um the core of it's actually pretty strong it's the fill it's the wispy bits so this is what it looks like you can tell there's this core down the middle and then it's got all these things attached to the edge so they attach that when they spin the whole thing um so the the and there are variants i've seen of eyelash ones from other companies that sell them where the the wispy bits are shorter so for this kind of thing, what you need to know if you're doing any kind of thread that's wispy like this, whether it's eyelash or, let me find my whisper here. Um, so this is whisper, which is actually thin enough that I can use this on cross-stitch fabric. In fact, I do a lot of my sheep with whisper. I think we talked about this last week or yeah. last time about, about being able to use that. So you could kind of see the textural difference there. This one has a much thinner core. Um, so you can use it on um, denser fabrics, like I would say up to 36 count. I did a little bit on um, 32 count and it just was, or on, on 40 count, and it, it just was too hard to pull it through. It wanted to pull the bits, the wispy bits off. Um, but you can tell here it's got a much shorter, the wispy bits are much shorter. Um, yeah. So for for um, um, needlepoint fabric, so this one here, I'll show you this one. So this is actually the whisper. So I did two rows of tent stitch with just one strand. And you won't be able to tell this from the video because it's not quite fine enough granularity. But I can still see white canvas behind it. I did two rows of it with two ply. And then it covers really well. So the other way you can do it is if you want to combine it with another thread, I would combine it with a strand of um, Appleton Cruel Wool because then you get the, the stability of the Cruel Wool and you get the fuzziness of the Whisper and you kind of get the best of both worlds. And then this okay. is Angora, which is uh, another one of the Rainbow Gallery threads. Let me find where I stuck it here. Um, right. and we do have a question, actually, quick question too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, um, someone asked, D asked, would you iron your piece after using the fluffy or eyelash? Uh, well, anytime I iron stuff, if I iron stuff, I do it face down into a terry cloth towel. And that's so I don't crush the threads. But if you were going to do something like this or the Angora or one of the other ones where you've got that really, where you've got that fuzziness, um, then just go back over it with, um, with this tool. So this is actually the tool I was going to show you. This is a, um, it's called a nap brush. Um, I'm not sure what they're originally made for, but you can also do it with a, um, uh, a medium or a hard bristle toothbrush. This, you don't, so when you do this, you don't take it and rub it like this. You actually, if you look at this sideways, you can tell that these are angled. I'll lay it in my hand, it's probably easier to see. You can tell that they're angled, it's almost L-shaped. And so for it, what you do is you grab, you take this and you basically lift upwards. So you're not really rubbing it, you're just using it to lift. You know, it's the sort of Playtex lift and separate. Um, and then that way you see now I got it way, way fuzzier. Oh. So I can I can get it, I can get the nap on it raised quite a bit by doing that. I can even do that with the Arctic Rays, which is a completely man-made fiber, similar kind of effect. And doing the the, the lifty thing, I can actually make it much more pronounced. So even if I didn't want to do, say, a stitch like 
um, a turkey, like turkey work, which is something that you would do with something like wool and then you shear it with scissors to make it super fluffy. You can actually do something similar with a thread that's got that inherent property to it. So just kind of, so if you're doing for, there's a number of them. So Arctic Rays is this one down here, which is the man-made one. This actually has a slightly thicker core than the other two have, um, but it's also got more regular, more frequent and more regular wispy bits from it. So if you look at this up close, this looks a bit like what core cranic, cranic blending filament looks like. When if you just like cut a little tiny strip, it would look a bit like that. So this is kind of in that range. It's a polymide, um, a metallized thread. And so you get an interesting effect from it. I do it um, for, I would do it like for cat's whiskers or maybe the fluffy part of a tail where I wasn't necessarily after it being more of a wool look, but just still having a bit of the fluffiness to it. So there are a bunch of ones that you can get that give you that that give you that fuzzy effect if what you're after is animals. So if you're if you're a needle pointer, these work well because they are thicker and you can use them on 18 mesh and even 13 and below. If you're a cross stitcher, your best option is Whisper because it's thin enough that you can actually do it on 30 20, you know, 28, 32, 36 count fabric and not have it completely try to get shorn off <laughs> yeah and then other sort of textural ones for fluffiness but not near that fluffy um are the other wools so there's alpaca which is also a rainbow gallery thread so this has a little bit of fuzz to it you can kind of see that on the lane against Kathy, the white there. Kathy, do you, mm -hmm. do you have room that you can move away from yourself uh, three or four inches more toward the center yep. of the screen? Yep. Oh, the other way. Back this way? Yeah, more now. Okay. A little more. Okay, got it. Yep, let me move this out of the way then. How's Just that? so it's more centered, yeah. People can see a little got better. Got it. Okay, Thanks. that's cool. Um. So this is this is alpaca. Um, it is a hundred percent alpaca, but it's a little bit thicker than um, the Persian. So alpaca is a really soft wool, but it does have a bit of fuzziness to it. All wools, hundred percent wools, have a bit of fuzziness to them. That's the nature of them. If you look at them under a microscope, they look like Velcro. Um, so you can take advantage of that by again if you stitch with this you can use this to kind of raise the nap a little bit it won't do it as much as something like the really wispy guys but you can tell even just from me doing this over across my finger that i can actually raise the nap um, it will make it just enough fluffier that i get a little bit of fuzz to it but not a huge amount um, and then there's um the the cruel wool with this is the Appleton cruel. It's about the same weight as the Persian, but it's a little bit smoother, so it doesn't fuzz quite as much. Sorry, sorry, um, Kathy, you're right. You're right at the bottom of the screen again. <clears throat> okay, there we go. There. Now, there, would you I'll stick it up there? Yeah. Would you say that that if I'm going to use wool, that that's the probably the best wool and the best uh, uh, collection of colors? If I'm going to use wool. Uh, yeah, because it's got a range of about almost 500 colors. That'll do it, yep. And, and so that gives you a much better color range. It is um, a more Victorian palette. Um, that's actually what it was originally created for, was a sort of a Victorian style um, needlepoint counted work. Mm -hmm. And so it does have a few really bright colors, but it's got a lot more muted colors in it than some of the more contemporary pout lines do. So like um, Rainbow Gallery, when they released their Persian, um, which is also sold by Fleur de Paris as, your, as Big Hanks, and it's called Anhara, um, 
it's got a lot of it's got more um some more contemporary more vibrant colors so it's got kind of a different color range but i happen to like this the for the widest range but the other one that's really nice if you want a decent range actually a nice range but a slightly thinner thread this is bella Lusa. so again this is a wool but this is merino and merino wool is much softer so this is a bit thinner so there's that in comparison to those. And let me open up the, the cruel wool. So there's the cruel. So you get kind of a nice progression in size. So you can, in fact, actually do the Bella Lusso on crusted fabric. Now, I tried it on 40 count. So this is my, my test that I did. The BL002 is actually the Bella Lusso. It was just really super chunky. And it was kind of hard to get it as a full cross stitch. It would have worked fine as a tent stitch, as a half cross. But I think oh, it would have worked better on a 32 count. Okay, what if I, if, if you used it like for French knots, though, on a... Yeah, on oh, like it would a, work a great for French knots. Okay. Yeah, it would work hmm. great for French knots. Yeah, yeah. So it does have a smoother texture to it. So you're not going to get the same kind of fuzziness that you will get out of any of these others. So if you take the nap brush to it, you're not going to get much fluff. Merino right. tends to compact more together. So it doesn't have that sort of fluffy ends that it, that most of the rest of them do. Um, but, you know, any of the wools, primarily the straightforward wools, not so much the, the blend. So if you've got a, a blend like, um this is um i'll say it in a second this is silk and ivory and this is half silk half wool it gets a little bit of a fuzz to it but it's like a whole it's like a different kind of fuzz it's more like it pills rather than fuzzes um and that's a com because of the combination of the silk and the wool but sometimes you can turn that into a feature rather than a bug so if you've got textures if you're thinking of textures and you want to try some i would say you know particularly for some of these more fuzzy things you know contact a shop that you normally deal with and ask them what they have and then just buy i do when i do my testing i pick one color and i usually pick black because it's usually the one color everybody makes everybody makes black and if I put it on a white background like this, I can see the canvas through it. So it will tell me much better about what the coverage is like on needlepoint. than even on cross stitch fabric, I'll do it on white as well, because the same thing, it, it, I can tell whether or not I'm actually gonna be able to get the kind of coverage that I'm after. So if you're after a stark contrast, so like, let's say if you decided you wanted to try it with a bunch of white threads, I would do it with a dark fabric so that you can tell what the fabric looks like underneath it. So if you've got an issue of it not really filling the gaps that that you can actually tell that. But this, so this is kind uh, of mm -hmm. th this is really illustrating for me that even uh, no matter what the uh, technique you're using cross stitch needlepoint, whatever, the variety just here, if you want to uh, adjust texture throughout because um, even on a cross stitch, if you only did half crosses with some of this fuzzier stuff, you could get uh, get the same or get the texture. But just in, yeah. the, in this little grid you did here, you can see all kinds of options for modifying a design to give more texture and, and more of a realistic feel, particularly with animals. Yeah, and what I do, what I usually do with my tests, I, I do another set of tests for embroidery stuff where I do, you know, chain stitch and lazy daisies and French knots and spiral trellis and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for when I'm doing needlepoint ones, usually what I will do is I will do a couple of rows of tent stitch. And then this is actually a row of, you know, essentially sort of mosaic cashmere or whatever. It's over one thread and then over two um, elongated because then I can tell how it's gonna lay for, if I wanna do essentially satin stitch. Mm -hmm. So, and then, and then like I said, usually if I'm much more organized, I have a little grid I've created that maps to this and then I'll write in what the, I'm right in which direction this is oriented. And then I'll write in what it was I did with it. I, I had a few enough of these to do that I can actually, I know that I know what they are. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, being able to do the testing, I, I actually, you know, 
you know this, and I've mentioned it before, um, I own a couple of lasers. So I spend a lot of time doing testing of materials for lasers. It, exactly the same thing happens for needlework. It's like ha testing what you stitch with. Um, a lot of us just, I think a lot of people assume that um, someone else knows the answer for them. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I or somebody else doesn't know an answer. But that might not be your answer. So if you're thinking, well, gee, I'd like to do texture, but I don't really know what I want, then buy three or four of different kinds of something like black. Do a little, do a little test and go, oh, oh, I really like this is the, you know, this is the fuzziness I'm after. Or, you know, this works really great for my bunny, but I want this for something to do with a Halloween piece where I want it to have a cat and a witch and I want that some part of that to be super fluffy. So, you know, one answer doesn't fit everybody's needs. Yeah. So that's why I always say it's like it's good to ex it's good to experiment. Um, Sandy wants to know, can these fuzzier type threads work with like a turkey work stitch or would it just be um, confusing? Um, well, uh, in theory, but the problem is the construction of the thread. So for most of the fuzzy things, particularly something like the, like this one, you already have, if you cut, take this and then cut all the ends, because turkey work is you're doing a whole bunch of loops and then you're shearing all the loops off so that it's the ends that really give you the texture. I don't know how well this would hold up because it's chain, it's a sort of a chain stitched thing. See, if I pull on this, it's going to come undone. Uh, so oh, yeah. I don't think I don't think Arctic rays in particular would be good for turkey work. I think it would I think it would come apart. Um, Whisper would probably be OK. Even the Angora or the Alpaca or the Persian would be OK because they're completely twisted. They're not a chain stitch with something attached to them. So you need you kind of need to know the construction of the thread to know if it would work. But yeah, I think like the Whisper the Persian, the alpaca, the the regular stuff like that. The eyelash might, because I don't think the eyelash is actually chain stitched together. I think it's made differently. So the way you tell is you grab an end, and if you can get the thing to pull apart, yep, this is chain stitched. So yeah, so the eyelash wouldn't work, because what would happen is, is once you do the quirky work and you've, and you've sheared the loops off, eventually um, all of those chain stitches are going to come undone. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So stick with threads that are twisted as opposed to threads that have a chain stitch core. Most of the most of the slightly fuzzy ones are a regular core, but some of the super fuzzy ones are, are chain stitch core. That's actually how they attach the wispy bits as part of the, they do that as a part of when they're doing the twist of the chain together. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All sorts of weird stuff. Um, and then <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about, so, um, uh, neon rays, this is flat stuff. So neon rays, fireworks, frosty rays, flare, um, the cranic ribbons, uh, ribbon floss. There are a number of other ones that, um, are flat things, sparkle rays, um, Sparkle rays, the, the 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 ribbon one, not the sparkle braid. Um, these are all things that are flat, and you can still do. So, I mean, ideally, you know, you can do it with something where you really want to take advantage of the fact that it's flat. So, this makes really great satin stitches. Um, so does very velvet. If you lay very velvet side by side and take your time, it'll actually flatten it out, and then it looks kind of like velveteen. Um, so you can use, you can use the ribbon ones for really interesting textures. This is the place where I use my other tool and I use it for a variety of things other than this is, this is called a thread zap. Um, Beadsmith makes them. They actually make them, Beadsmith's company that makes beading supplies. Um, and they actually make it so that you can seal the ends of the monofilament, um, thread that a lot of beaders use. But um, because it will melt any man-made fiber, um, it works really super great for um, things like neon rays. I actually use it to to um, seal the ends of my 
just regular ribbons that I use for other things. So if you snip the end of it, this has a battery in the back of it. And if I hold this thing down, I just replaced the battery while ago. Um, so you, so it, it's kind of fuzzy. What will happen is, is it will literally melt the ends. In fact, I can smell it. It's not really a great smell, but it's okay. <laughs> so you can actually kind of hold it and smell it and it will, and then, and then it will, if you touch the ends of it, you can tell that it's actually burnt. So you can do the same thing with a, a match, but this is much safer. Just don't touch the end of it. You can, you, you can, you can, in fact, actually buy the replacement things for these because eventually the little thing does wear out. And you can, I, I know people who will actually, rather than just doing the ends, they'll kind of touch it near the near the end and then just let it burn off completely. Oh. But, but, and it does, and it, there is a bit of smoke coming out. And then, this is completely sealed now. So it makes it much easier if what you're trying to do is um, stitch with something that tends to sort of come apart. Um, there are threads that will come apart. It won't work with only because they don't have enough nylon or polyester in them. This ha this is neon raises hundred percent rayon. So it works well for that. And I, and I use it for my, um, I actually use it for my satin ribbon that I do other stuff with because on there, it just really does a really clean finish on the end of it, which is surprise works surprisingly well. So for the flat things, you can get you can get neon rays, which is super shiny. Um, you can get fireworks, which is metallic shiny. So this gets into the when somebody asks me, I want shiny. My question to them is, do you want metallic shiny or do you want shiny shiny? And they are really different. So metallic, you get that reflection of light where it really does look slightly metallized. Um, and with something like neon rays, with it being rayon, you get that super, super shiny light bounce from it. Um, and if you run your finger on it, it's really, really smooth. That's not the case for the metallic kinds of things. So when you're thinking about, oh, I want something shiny, think about, am I after metallic or, or am I after really after shiny? And the other shiny threads um, besides neon rays are kind of make a side before ray are panache, which is a, another one of the round threads. And this is actually thin enough you can do cross stitch, uh, probably up to about 32 count. Um, and then for the thing that I that I use but love to hate, um, um, DMC rayon floss or satin floss. And as you can tell, it has a mind of its own. <laughs> so this stuff, yeah. this stuff is really a pain in the ass to stitch with because it really does want to separate when you're stitching with it. But you get a really, really nice effect from it. It gives you that sort of shine that you can't really get. It, mm -hmm. Silk does not have the same shine as rayon does. Does it just has a completely different light reflectivity to it. Um, so I use this in areas where I want the shine, but I'm not going to use a ton of it because otherwise I want to tear my hair out when I'm working with it, and <laughs> I prefer my stitching to be more entertaining than that. So yeah, in the when, other it, when it comes thing, apart, when it comes apart in the skein like that, yeah. Ugh. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not fun. It's not fun. So for the other flat guys here that I was going to show, um, there's flare and frosty rays. So flare is tubular nylon. So think actual nylons. It's like it's like hosiery, only it's thicker. Um, it is a tube. So if you stuck a needle down the middle of this, it's actually, it is in fact actually done as a complete tube, um, which is why they can make frosty rays, which is flare with a thread down the core. Probably easier to see if I put my, put it there. You can see, actually, if I hold it like this, you can probably tell better. See, there's a thread down the middle of that thing. Um, you can actually make your own frosty rays. Um, it, it's a little cumbersome because you need a needle that's not going to pierce the, you just want, you want a long needle and you want something that's not going to actually pierce the thread itself. You have to kind of wedge this open with something like a crochet hook. 
And then if you can put a long needle down the middle of it, then you can run a thread down the middle. So if you have like some weird color combination you absolutely need to have, you can make your own. It's a little hard. It, it's, it's not hard, it just takes a little bit of time to do. And these give a very different effect because if you're doing, if you're stitching with this, you're gonna get that sort of slightly shiny, almost watery kind of look. Um, and if you do it with this, you're gonna get that coupled with the thread that's in the middle. And that's gonna give you a denser look than this on its own will. So a lot of times people will do, um, like if you do this on top of white and you don't do tent stitch, and let's say you do a satin stitch, you get this sort of um, slightly black effect. It's almost like a charcoal um, effect. Um, but if you do it as tent stitch, it's gonna show up much blacker. Um, so sometimes it depends on the stitch as well as to what the effect looks like. But and I've seen people use it on painted, I think I've seen, excuse me, I'm sorry, I've seen people use it on like on painted canvases. Um, so you can still kind yeah. of see the painted canvas. Um, and I'm thinking yeah. of something, someone I think used it for waves or something, it's all blue. It was very um, effective. Yeah, and in fact, actually, there's another thread, I'm going to get up for just a sec, there's another thread called Water and Ice which is oh. not a tube. Um, it's actually completely flat, but it's much more transparent. And so it gives a very different effect. Um, I'm gonna get the white one because that's easier to see usually. The white and the blue are the two of the water and ice that we saw the most of. It, it almost looks like cellophane. Actually, it looks kind of like crinkly cellophane. So that's water and ice. So this is a, really does kind of look like cellophane. So you can kind of just barely see it in my hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you lay this on top of something that's, well, let's put it on top of my, my brown thing, my wood thing here, you can see the, you can see the wood through it um, yeah. and you get this really interesting sparkly effect. So the white and the blue are the two we sell the most of for people who are on to do water or sometimes slightly um, uh, sparkly sky without it really being metallic. But it's another one of these flat threads that work well for if you're gonna do something like um, sometimes longer stitches because the longer stitches will take more advantage of this flatness of the thread than it will if you're just doing this, a straight pin stitch. So I would do, if I'm doing this on a painted canvas, which I've done, I will sort of figure out how to do something kind of like a satin stitch. I might have a pattern to the stitch and it's not just a straight satin stitch, but something that's more elongated so that you get you get to take advantage of the, the sort of watery texture that's there. Do all of those uh, but, flat ones um, seal off with your little heater tool? On the end? Yeah, because they're all they're all usually either rayon or nylon. Okay, so that's yeah. a good a good yeah. thing to use that for then. Yeah, yeah, it is. You can because this will this has a tendency to really this has a tendency to really come apart on the ends. Mm -hmm. So you you can definitely if you hold it and then usually what I would do is hold it, twist it, and then seal it. Um, then it will work much better, and then you can just snip the ends. Yeah, sometimes thread management is a is a challenge with the specialty stuff, just because of the fact that they um, have a mind of their own and not necessarily wanting to do what you want them to do. And the <laughs> other thing that, and I think I mentioned this uh, either last time or the time before, the thing that's nice about something like this thread, like the the um, the um, the frosty rays is you can actually um, use it to ruche. So ruche is where you take something and you um, pull it so that you've um, pinched a core down. So if I pull the core out, then you see I get this really interesting little ball here. Mm -hmm. I can't do that with flare because flare doesn't have a core. I can do it with the frosty rays because even though the outside is really flare, I'm taking advantage of the fact that there's a core there. And so it allows me to be able to bunch the whole thing together. So a lot of people doing um, uh, 
you can use it for like flowers on say like a hat on a on something on a um, a needlepoint canvas you could use it for actual you know flowers in a garden you could in fact do this on not super dense cross stitch fabric so if you wanted to have like say you were doing an animal and you wanted a really poofy tail but you didn't want to do it with one of the other kinds of threads you could start this on the back um ruche it and then anchor it and then pull the core to the back side and tie it off so you can do a lot of fun things with it just because the fact that it's got this property of that there's that core in there and then the nice thing about this is if i decide i don't really want to do that all i really need to do is just straighten it back out again mm. so you can kind of play with it and see again part of the you do experiments to see what works for you um some people like that effect some people don't um it just depends sometimes a lot of times it also depends on the canvas like does it really fit well with what the design is so those are some of the flat ones like i said there's a bunch of others the 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 cranic ribbons the 16th eighth inch and quarter inch ribbons are also flat um the ribbon floss from yli is also flat um there are a couple of other sparkle rays there's a couple of other um rainbow gallery threads threads that are flat as well that have slightly different properties to them so those are kind of good to have but yeah so for tools these two things are nice to have so the thread zap and the the nap brush are good things if you're wanting to sort of add a bit of texture to your stuff and play with it a bit um so you can I, and this is the other flat thing we talked about this last time we were talking about taking threads apart when we were deconstructing everything <laughs> last time right um i did i did in fact actually cut mine apart um i cut it down a little bit to see if i could stitch with it on cross stitch fabric and i could and it did actually hold up okay and not so great on the 40 count because i couldn't quite get it thin enough but i think it would work great on the 32 and on and so this is the this piece here this is actually this um straw silk um and it works really nicely um whether you're doing it as tent stitch or in this case my sort of sideways satin stitch so uh you can use this for i use this for places where i want a more of a almost like a wood texture without it necessarily really being wood so tree trunks, tree branches, um, doors, um, even sometimes stone um, areas where there might be stone because it has this very, it's a very matte finish. Um, so there's very little light reflectivity to this. So if you put this next to a super shiny thread like this, you can tell there's a really, there's oh, a yeah. really stark difference between yeah. those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's not just given the fact that it's a different color. It's just really the fact that one is super matte and one is, in this case, really metallic. So that's the other thing you can play with is not just the textural changes, but also the how does the matte shiny within that texture also give you a different look. So you can put three different shiny threads together, and if they're not the same shininess, you will get some depth of field. You won't necessarily get a lot, but you'll get some. So this, this I like because of the fact that you can actually kind of almost cut it and then tear it. I just don't tear it very far because once I get to, once, uh, once I get too far, um, then it wants to split further. So I try not to do it for too mm. long. I just do it for little okay. short sections, but that works really nice for texture. Mm -hmm. All right, we have another question. How do you know what size works on what size of canvas? What size of ribbon? Um, uh, it depends on the canvas and it also depends on the stitch. So if you're doing um, straight tent stitch or basket weave, um, the nice thing about most of the rainbow gallery threads is that they will actually tell you what they're for. So like the Capri, which this is a polyester thread, it says needlepoint 14 to 18, that means tent stitch. A long stitch 13 to 18, that means satin stitch. So this would work um fine for if for a 13 count you probably actually would want they actually make a, a 13 capri so on its own it will work as for tent stitch so the thing the nice thing about the rainbow gallery threads is that there's usually some clues that they give you 
Um, but for everything else, it's kind of experience, um, either your own personal experience or, or if you're buying it from a shop, um, their experience. Sometimes people will just send me an email and say, I found this thread in my stash. I mm -hmm. want to know, can I use it on this canvas? And my answer will, well, my, my first answer is or my question is usually what can canvas and what stitch. Um, so some things that are thicker, like the ribbons, um, if I were going to do this on 24 count Congress cloth, this would not work for 10 stitch. It's just too, th it's too flat, but it will work great for satin stitch. Um, and would it work great for 13 mesh? It won't cover as well, but you might be able to do two passes to get it to cover better. So sometimes it's just playing with it to see what works. The other thing that matters a lot in here is tension. No two people's tension is identical. So you might stitch a thread and go, gosh, I love this. This is fabulous. And the your best friend or your stitching buddy stitches with it and says, I have no idea what you were drinking when you stitched with that <laughs> stuff because I hate it. And sometimes it's just really a function of your tension might be super loose. Theirs might be super tight. Mine tends to be really tight. Um, I took a class, I don't know, 25, almost, yeah, probably 25, almost 30 years ago from a guy who taught Brazilian embroidery. And those threads are all rayon. They are super, super strong. And he said, I was the first person he'd ever met who could actually break them. <laughs> and I did oh. that because my tension, I, I was trying to do bullions and my tension was so tight that I could actually break the thread. So, you know, I had to loosen, I had to learn how to chill a bit when I did that, use those particular things. <laughs> um, you know, some of it, like I said, so some of it's just your own experience. Some of it, um, does the manufacturer give you clues? Um, and if not, then if you're dealing with a shop, in theory, they might have clues. Um, you know, I would kind of hope that most of us who are selling threads have at least some passing familiarity of what they're used for. Um, <laughs> not every, well, not everybody's going to have that. You know, you got a right. new shop owner who's had a shop for less than six months. They're not going to have the same experience I have. Right. That doesn't mean that they're not knowledgeable. They just don't have the same history. Um, yeah. And a lot of times, if I don't have a history with the thread, I will either ask the person I buy it from, or I will ask one of my fellow shop owners, like, okay, I've seen this thread, I've never stitched with it, How, what do I do? And, you know, if it's somebody who's worked with it, they're, they're gonna, they're, you know, their answer might be, well, you can use it on 18 mesh, but you're going to need a bigger needle and you're going to need to twist it a bit. That's usually my answer for silk and ivory is that you need to twist it a bit because it works better on 14 mesh than it does on 18, although that's what we sell it the most for. Um, so, yeah, it just, you know, some of it's just experimentation. And yeah. most of these threads are not super expensive. Silk is always going to be the most expensive. Hand dyed silk will be the most expensive any of, of any of these. Actually, I don't have any hand dyed ones in here. Um, you know, if you're kind of looking at stuff going, gee, I kind of think I'd like to try that, buy a card of two or three things and play with it. You know, maybe it's a, you know, eight or ten dollar investment in those three cards, but maybe that advances your knowledge about what you like to stitch with um, and helps you, you know, expand your horizons for whatever your next project is or, or the current project that you're working on. Yeah, the, I think and... experimentation, I think experimentation is a good thing. Yeah. And these are all things that uh, uh, Beth and Jennifer and I have talked about, and I think we did the last time too with you. Uh, you take a, a cross stitch uh, design like Spring Hill, where there's several places where you don't have you're filling fields, and nothing says you have to make X's for all that field. Uh, you can take uh, one of these threads and do satin stitches or longer stitches, and create an effect that you can't get with just DMC crosses and uh, yeah. uh, stitch a field faster, but also get an effect that you that, that enhances the overall design uh, and, and take advantage of these. So it, uh, yeah, a lot of these uh, tend to fall into the needlepoint category, but uh, there's a lot of opportunity, I think, in, in cross stitch and certainly with embroidery, surface embroidery, to use these to advantage too, to get a, a visual effect. Right. Yeah, definitely. And the embroidery stitches lend a whole different um, look to all of this. So if you're doing, say, one of the fuzzy threads, um, like Whisper, um, as a chain stitch or as a stem stitch, 
you're going to get a very different look than if you do. I've done this actually, I've done the straw silk as a stem stitch. And you get a really interesting look from that because of the fact that you've got this very matte plant like, I mean, it, it looks like a plant fiber. Mm -hmm. um, and so you get a very different look, or you might do it as a whipped chain, as a whipped chain stitch. You know, you, you lay the chain stitch and then you stitch around it so that you end up with something that looks more like an actual three dimensional, say, tree branch or something. So, yeah, you can use a lot of these um, for all of the techniques to give you a different look. And they might work better with some things for, than others because the fact if the thread is thick, yeah, it's not going to work super well for doing straight cross stitch. But if you're doing French knots with it or if you're doing um, satin stitch over, say, five or six stitches um, and you're using a slightly bigger needle to open your holes, it might work perfectly fine. Some that, of it really is just that whole experiment. Yeah, that straw silk that you had there, I, I bought a couple, three skeins of that one day just because it looked like it'd be fun. And I've never really gotten a good sense of how to use that. Do you use that as primarily a satin stitch or um, what, what's been your experience with that? Um, it really depends on the effect I'm after. So I will do it as um, just regular tent stitch if what I want is that completely matte texture. Mm -hmm. The fact that I get that the fact that I get no shininess from this at all. Um, it, it, it is actually surprisingly more matte than wool is. Oh. And some of that is because of the fact that it's flat and wool is twisted, so you get a little bit more reflectivity from it. Um, so I, you know, just kind of play with it and see. I tell people if you're, particularly if you're working on a canvas and you don't have practice fabric, just stitch a little, just stitch a couple, three rows in the corner and go, oh, oh, I like that. Uh, well, okay, maybe not so much for 10 stitch, but maybe I'll try it for satin stitch. Mm hmm. And you can do things like, like with this, you can do things like, um, say, brickwork, um, because it's going to give you that, that almost pebbly texture that you get from looking at an actual brick. And if you do it with a brick pattern, so a slight satin stitch that are offset, then you can actually get something that looks remarkably like bricks. Okay. So I would just say, you know, just just try a little in the corner and see what works on your canvas and see if it gives you kind of the, the look you're after. But I like it both for the texture it gives and also for the complete matteness that it gives. Yeah, see, and I did not view it in that way. So now that uh, but now that I think about it, yeah, there's no light reflecting off that to speak of. It's just dead there. So, OK, so that makes yeah. a, it makes yeah, a nice contrast. And, then. And even in comparison to say something like the Capri, because this is polyester, polyester has less sheen to it than rayon does. Even here, the polyester is pretty matte, but this is even more matte. Yeah, that's remarkable there, the difference. Yeah, so you can use the, not only the texture itself, you know, how, how fuzzy, how flat, how smooth, all of those things, but then also as a part of the texture, is think of the whole matteness and shininess and metallicness of it as a, a part of the the sort of depth of field that you might be creating. Mm -hmm. So if you want it to be, say, a piece where the foreground comes to you and the background recedes, then the background is usually more matte because then your eye gets drawn backwards and the and because it starts in the front where the shininess is. Yeah. And if you want it to be the other way around, then you do it exactly the opposite. You make it more shiny in the back and then you make it more matte at the front. So, you know, a whole bunch of different ways to treat it. And in fact, you can do an, 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 a, a little test of that with, you know, do a square within a square and reverse them mm -hmm. and see which one you like better because they're going to look completely different based on which one is in the front, which one is technically in the front, which one's kind of in the back in that regard. Yeah, for needlepoint in particular, for a lot of the hand painted canvases, part of what you're trying to achieve with either stitches, different stitches, or different threads is that sort of depth of field, is the fact that you don't want it to be completely flat. So if you're doing a, a garden design and you want the flowers to come to the foreground, 
um, doing something like either a super shiny thread or doing French knots gives you that three dimensionality to it and helps it bring it to the foreground and makes it look more dimensional and gives you a little bit more of that depth of field. Yeah. So yeah, lots a, of ways to do that. Mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. question, do the ribbon threads or the fuzzy threads come in variegated colors or are they all solids? They are generally all solids because very few the people don't generally hand dye them. Um, there used to be someone who hand dyed one of the fuzzy threads, the mohair, but they don't dye it anymore. And it was mm -hmm. never really variegated. It was really still kind of mostly more solid. Um, this stuff, the, the straw silk, because it's hand dyed, it's not hand dyed to make it variegated but because it's hand dyed it's never completely solid so some of the colors let me go grab one some of the colors have a bit more um color change to them than others do usually things like the greens that happens with and i'm sure that they make they they do a little bit to make that effect but it's not like they're really trying to do say like you know eight different colors in it or even four so this is um, uh, manzanilla, and there's a bit of, let me move these guys out of the way. There's a bit of a color change in it. Not a huge amount, but there's a little bit. You get, you get spots where there's a little bit lighter and spot, or spots where it's a little bit darker. So if you stitch with it, you don't get a solid mass. And then some of the colors, um, this is summer sky. This one is one of the few that they actually do dye with different colors in it. So there's actually blue and purple in it. Probably tell a bit more here where you can kind of see in the knot, there's blue and there's purple. But yeah, most of the specialty threads like that generally don't have the hand dyed um, thing done to them because I think in part because many of them are really super hard to work with. I can't and I cannot imagine how hard it would be to like try to dye the eyelash stuff. <laughs> um, because you know it, it has to be it has to be you know wound into something that they can immerse in water and then you've got the whole how do you spool it or skein it or whatever when you're done and I, I think some of that is just it, people just are like yeah there's just way too much work there <laughs> right not to say that you couldn't potentially dye your own I mean that's always a possibility um so these are some of the other rainbow gallery threads that, that are really great for texture. And it's a combination of different sorts of um, fiber content. These are all round threads. Um, so panache, this is 100% rayon. So this is, so as pearl cotton is to floss, um, panache is to the DMC um, rayon floss. So this stuff is stranded. This stuff isn't. Um, this stuff is actually way easier to work with because it's not <laughs> stranded. It doesn't have that completely fly away, make me insane um, kind of feel to it. So you get a nice sheen from this. Um, in contract with the, the Capri, which is the polyester, you can see there's a really kind of hard to see with the black, but there's a really big difference in the sheen. This is super shiny. This is more matte. So if you put these two together, you're going to get, oh, again, that, a, a little bit of that depth of field. But they're just round threads. Sparkle Braid is um, another one of the metallic threads, kind of like um, a Krynic metallic or an Averiswa metallic. So this is probably closer to like a, it's between a blending filament and a number four. It's probably about like a number two. This works really nicely for cross-stitch because it is actually thin enough. Um, and so you get some color options in it that you don't see in the other metallics. Uh, and so that can give you a really nice effect. It's also one of the polyester ones. Most all of these are either polyester or rayon or have some polyester in them. So Entice is rayon and polyester. So this is another one of the braids. Entice is rayon and polyester. Glisten is merino wool and polyester. Silk Lame is silk and rayon and polyester. 
These are all made essentially the same way. Rainbow Gallery actually makes these. Um, and they're all um, strands of threads um, in a machine that actually does this interesting jacquard loom dance um, and with the mixture of whatever the base threads are and the blending filaments that go in it. So there's, I think that there's one other one as well. Um, forget what the other one is. Um, and so they have the same weight, but the texture is completely different because you've got silk, you've got wool, you've got, um, you've got rayon. So I was out of the straight black in this one, but it's actually shinier than either of these two because it's the rayon base. So again, you can even just take three different threads made the same, but the, but the core of their component, the, the main part of their component is different and you'll get a different light reflectivity from it. So those are kind of fun ones to play with. And yeah, then um, rainbow galleries, mm -hmm. uh, the first time I went to a Nashville show and, and saw the breadth of thread types that they have and so many colors within each one. Uh, I don't think they get credit for, you know, if, if you want a different look, you can pretty much find it in their line of, of uh, uh, threads. They just have so many options. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I've got a question. Well, what, what's the, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. What, so what is the weight on those three? You said they're all about the same. So the entice, the glisten, the silk lame braid, are they like, I'm, I'm thinking like, these are, like a pearl the, in, no, in comparison to a pearl. Made, yeah, so these are all made for 18 count canvas. So okay. they would be about the equivalent of a Pearl 5. They're not quite that thick. They're just a little bit thinner than that, but that's what they're made for. Now, Silk Lame actually comes in three sizes. So there's one called Silk Lame Petite, which you can, in fact, actually cross-stitch with. Um, and then there's one made for 13 mesh, so it's thicker. And then there's the 18. Um, the Capri, which was the one that is just the polyester, there's a 13 and an 18 mesh version of this one. So for some of the threads, Rainbow Gallery makes more than one weight because they recognize that there's a market for that. About 10 years ago, the market for 13 mesh canvas um, for hand painted stuff got to be larger as a lot more people decided they wanted to stitch on a bigger mesh and they did, and 18 was too small for them. Um, given I stitch on 55 count cross stitch fabric, 18 still seems enormous to me. But I'm okay. sure I will reach a point in my life where that is not the case. <laughs> so it's nice to know that there are that there are threads out there for that. So yeah, they, these would work for an 18 mesh canvas. And if you were doing them for a cross stitch fabric, I would say they would probably still work to like maybe. Um, they, they're probably not going to work on Ada so much because the way the squares are woven, um, it, there's not a whole lot of movement when you try to open the hole. But they would probably work up to like maybe 20 or even 25 count cross stitch fabric if you were willing to fiddle with it a bit. Because cross stitch fabric has more flexibility to it than, um, than needlepoint fabric, needlepoint canvas has. The stuff is obviously got bigger holes because the individual threads are spun a bit thinner, but um, you'll get a different look on an 18 mesh canvas than you'll get on an 18 count linen. But even at 20 and 25, some of this stuff will work okay if you're willing to fiddle with it a bit. All right, we have another Again, question. Again, some of that is, mm -hmm. oh, um, I thought you were done. How many, how many strands of floss is equivalent to panache? Um, I believe panache is six. It's either okay. four or six. Um, pen, so patina is the old one. Patina is going is has been slowly going away as they run out of inventory, uh, and the panache is thinner. So I think this is closer to. I think this is probably closer to four, and the patina was thicker and it was closer to six. Okay. So somewhere in that range, they're not always really a great comparison because the, the, they don't make them the same way. So you, you kind of have to, you know, in some cases it might be say like three and a half. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. It, it would be nice if there was a standard for it all, but there isn't. So, um, and then for the other slightly weird texture, um, there's the DMC etoile. 
that they came out with a couple of years ago. Um, and this is a filament that's twisted in, you know, I've never even looked to see what in the world the fiber content on this thing is. Uh, I'll have to look it up. I think it's actually still cotton. I think it's got cotton and maybe some wool in it, but it, it's really fluffy. So unlike regular floss, so this is, um, there were actually, there's five strands in here. I think I took one out. I think there were six because um, I stitched a little with it on one thing. Um, uh, it's got a different texture to it because of the fact that it's got the filament in it. So you get a little bit of fuzziness and you get a little bit of shine. But if you take it apart into its individual strands, this is actually a nice um, press stitch thread. So you can do this probably up to about maybe 36. I did a tiny bit of it on my 40 count and it was just a bit too dense. It kind of sort of worked. That's what this one is. Um, but it was just a little too dense. I could do it for a small area, but I wouldn't do a really big area. So I think 36 count it would probably still work okay. And then, I, and then I just used all of them on their own. I actually, that's what I did one of the, that's what I did this one with. This is my very first one was actually that one. So there's just a tiny bit of sparkle in there. Hard to tell in the photograph, but in, if I look at it at a slight angle, I can tell that there's actually some sparkly bits in there. So again, it's something where you want a little bit of a matte surface with a little bit of metallic sparkle. You kind of get the best of both in there. Um, and then for oddball ones, there's mandarin floss, which is made out of bamboo. So this is actually strandable. And again, this is a pretty matte thread because of the, the of it being a plant fiber. It's 100% bamboo. Um, you can stitch with all four strands on 18 mesh. Um, on 13, you would want to use six. Um, you would want to, usually for things like a 13 mesh, if I'm doing it with a strandable thread, I'll take the threads apart and put them back together again because it plumps them up a bit. But you can take this apart and stitch with it on cross stitch as well. And it and it's a really nice thread for that. This is the, so this is the 40 count linen and you can tell. So 40 count probably is a bit too dense for it, but I think up to 36, it would probably still work okay. It's about the same weight as a strand of cotton floss but it has a different texture to it because of the bamboo. So there is a little bit of, there is a little bit of sort of wispiness in there. Well, not really quite wispy, more fuzzy. So that's, that's a, that's a fun thread to play with. And then um, when you get into the silks, you end up with things that are a bit more shiny. So you've got the Soie Perlet. Is it Big Ben time? Must be. You know, I don't know. My clock has not rung in weeks, and all of a sudden it decided tonight it's going to ring, 8 o'clock. I don't know. Oh. Hey, it, just wanted, it, it, it wanted some love. Oh. <laughs> so these are um, silk pearls. This is Trebizond, and this is um, Soie Perlet. The Trebizond is actually made for um, 18 mesh canvas. So it's a little thick for most cross stitch stuff. You could probably do it on a 20 count. Um, I have in fact actually done it on a 20 count linen, um, but the Soie Perlet works really nicely on a 28 count. Um, it's about two strands of the equivalent of about two strands of floss. So again, because it's silk, you're gonna get a little bit of that slightly shiny, um, more reflectivity, but not as much reflectivity as um, a rayon thread um, and then there's the traditional um, silk floss, which will also give you a bit of more of a shine. So if you compare like these two, if you put these two together in the same piece, they will look different, both because of the fact that one's round and one's not. Um, but usually round threads like the Soie Perlet and the Trebizond, the, the way light works you're going to get more surface area that it bounces off of because of the fact that it's twisted. And so you get the, the bounce from all of those surfaces. And so it will look a little bit shinier than if you just do it with um, Soie d'Alger or NPI or Splendor or any other one. 
um, any of the slightly rounded, any of the rounded twisted threads will give you a little bit more of a light bounce than the rest of them were. And then there are um, other things in the silk line that are slightly shiny, but not quite. This is uh, Pepper Pot from um, Planet Earth. And so it's not quite as smooth as silk thread as like the Trebizond or the Swap Relay. So you get a bit more texture to it, but you get a little bit of that shininess. And then if, and then there's also the, the Vineyard Silk, which is similar. It's a little smoother than the Pepper Pot is. So it has a tendency to show up just a tiny bit shinier than the Pepper Pot does. And also, it's big, like I said, it's a bit smoother. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, anyway, those are ideas. I mean, I, I didn't bring everything up because we carry 140 <laughs> different kinds of threads. This is not even remotely close to all of them. <laughs> but it gives you a good idea of the textural options that are out there. And that, you know, if you want, if you want to do a texture for a cross stitch piece or an embroidery piece, or um, a needlepoint piece, and you're not sure what to use, you know, ask your local shop owner um, what kinds of interesting threads they carry. You know, do you have things other than, you know, stranded silk or stranded cottons or pearl cotton? You know, what else do you have? And just, you know, even ask them, so what would you use that for? Because they might tell you something that you go, oh, I never thought I could use that kind of a thread for that. I mean, because you can actually even do regular stitches with things like silk ribbon. It doesn't have to be ribbon embroidery. And you can do French knots with something like Guild Silk Twist, even though it's got a, a metal wire uh, in it. It's actually got enough flexibility that you can do French knots. So sometimes it's just, you know, what you learn about the properties of a particular thread. Yeah, when I look at your but little I, grid, I, when I look at your little grid there, I, you know, to me, it's <clears throat> different paint brushes. Uh, you know, if you're a yeah, painter, you, you know, and, and here, here are all your paint brushes, depending on what effect you want. Yeah. 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 Very much that way. Yeah. Uh, and so for particularly for canvas work, you know, it's the combination of um, the thread and the stitch. Mm -hmm. So again, it gets back to my, you can be a really fabulous needle pointer and only ever know how to do stitch. Tent stitch, A, I think to do tent stitch really well is a skill of its own. Um, but if you want to add texture to it and you don't ever want to have to learn how to do a specialty stitch, you can just do it by changing up the threads. Yeah. And then when you add different stitches in with the threads, um, then you get the, the texture of the stitch, you get the texture of the thread, you get the light bounce of the thread, you get all of those things kind of, you know, working in, in you know, tandem so that you can get a very different look. Yeah. But yeah, I encourage people to, you know, if you kind of want to branch out into something you've never tried before, buy a card or a skein or two of something you've never tried that you think will work on whatever count you normally work on. Um, and just take it for a spin and, you know, try some stitches or just do tin stitch or just do some French knots or whatever floats your boat and see what works for you. Cause I think you'd be surprised that, you know, some things that you never thought of as something you want to add to your stitching arsenal um, might actually prove to be useful. Yep. Excellent. Thank anyway, you, Kathy. Right. That was it. Oh. Yeah, thank you. Lots of ideas running through my head now. Yeah. yeah. Were there any other questions? I, no, I think that was it. All right. Okay. Good deal. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, thanks to okay. everybody. Okay. Um, join us uh, now next Wednesday. Carrie Noss is going to teach us, uh, show us needle lace. So join us for that. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, every time we do this, we learn something. It's really fun. Uh, appreciate it. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye.